Fluorescent lamps contain mercury vapor and inert gas. When current flows, the electrons hit the mercury atoms. Energy is transferred to the mercury electrons, pushing them into higher orbits around the atom. When these electrons fall back to their original orbits, they release this energy in the form of ultraviolet radiation. The ultraviolet radiation is converted into visible light by the phosphor coating on the inside of the glass bulb. Remember these? Laser light made records obsolete. NASA is on the verge of doing the same thing with space-based communications. Before the end of the decade, the Laser Communication Relay Demonstration Mission will revolutionize the way we move tons of data from orbit to ground and all around the solar system. The demand for vast transmission capability grows exponentially. Sensors are gathering more data than ever sophisticated command and control software talks more and asks more. Conventional radio frequency transmissions can't meet the need. That's why engineers at Goddard and partners like MIT Lincoln Lab, the Jet Propulsion Lab, and Space Systems Loral are working on the next generation of high data rate, low mass optical systems. Their goals are nothing short of imagining the future and bringing it to life. Imagine live, high-definition video feeds from faraway places in the solar system. That's the promise of LaserCom. The beauty of LaserCom is its scalability. Missions will see profound improvements, with speeds increasing from 10 to 100 times over today's RF transmissions. And huge bandwidth improvements are just the beginning. Reductions of hardware mass and power demands will see equivalent savings. Smaller communication systems mean more efficient power management, and more efficient power management unlocks a wealth of potential engineering options for other systems. LaserCom is just one part of NASA's new initiative to commercialize space. This particular demonstration will hitch a ride on a LoRaL communications satellite in 2017. Once on orbit, control of the optical module will be turned over to NASA Goddard for testing. 
two-way data transmissions from ground stations at White Sands, New Mexico, and NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California will put the system through its paces. But just a few years after a successful demonstration, NASA's own telecommunications relay system could be replaced with the more advanced hardware. Data transmission by laser light. That's a bright idea. And as a means for moving huge amounts of data efficiently and effectively, it's the communications backbone of ambitious plans for the nation's future in space. Welcome to Glasgow. We're going to be watching live surgery. With me here is Dr. David Tienan and his expert technicians. They're, they're preparing the patient on uh, patient Kevin, who is a project manager, very nearsighted, who's anxious to get rid of his glasses. On Kevin's left is the intralase laser, which is going to be used to create that protective LASIK flap. On his right is the Visex laser, which will correct his refractive error. They're doing the final preparations right now for the procedure. This will be his left eye. He's had his right eye done just a few minutes ago. So let's watch. The first step of this procedure, Dr. Tienan's gonna put a soft ring around the white part of the eye. This will help stabilize the eye. So he's got it on, looks well centered. It's now well seated. Next, he's going to dock the laser with that ring. She's going to be doing some alignments now. There it is. He's, he's starting the dock. That looks good. It looks really good. He's going to finalize the dock. Okay, it's, it's locked in. Now the technician over here on our left is going to take and precisely align that protective flap. Looks good. The laser's already started now. You can see it going from bottom to top. So we're about halfway done now. It looks great. You can see how stable the eye is, and there's no pain throughout this procedure. Okay, that's done. So the protective LASIK flap is now completed. So that ring has already come off the eye. They're going to swing the patient now to the right. This is what's called an eczema laser, the Visex Star S4, which is the latest generation state-of-the-art laser. So they're aligning the eye right now getting them all set up. The lights, as you can see, have gone dim. There's the alignment. Next, Dr. Tienan's gonna put a little device in to hold the eyelids apart. Maybe the patient doesn't have to worry about blinking. Looks good. Next, he's gonna look at that uh, protective flap, and it's, he's inspecting it right now. And now he's gonna take it very gently uh, look at the flap itself. He's examining the flap. Looking, looking really good. Very, very nice flap. The lights are going even dimmer now, and he's turned on the iris, iris registration and the eye tracker. So if you look here, right now the laser is spotting many details in the eye to get a lock. It just got a lock. And you can see on the screen that it has a lock. Uh, it's captured all the iris detail to precisely align the eyes. The treatment is very customized and precisely aligned. Okay, now he's lifting, he's gonna lift the flap. Oh, it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful flap. He's lifted the flap now. And now he's already got the eye tracker on, the eyes aligned, the tracker's on. The laser's gonna start in just a second. There it goes, you can hear the snaps of the laser. The laser snapping. You can see it counting down on the left hand side. So the laser, this laser treatment takes quite a long time to do in this in Kevin because well he's, he's so nearsighted. He, there's a really excellent eye tracker that's tracking any movement of the eye. And you can see that. You can see it knows where the eye is, but knows how to precisely align it. We're a little over halfway done now. It's looking good. All the patient's looking at is a flashing red light. OK, 
younger, no discomfort, they're looking good. Patients being uh, really, really, uh, uh, really very well right now. It's just, it's going super well. Very nice alignment. Dr. King just making sure that everything is looking good. We're just about done with the laser. Last couple seconds, and that's it. So the next step now, and the, really the last step, last big step, is for that protective LASIK flap to go back down. Looking at it. So the flap, that protective flap is now back on. And now Dr. Tina is going to make sure it's in a perfect position. It's looking good. It's inspecting it. Good. It's just, again, going to check to make sure the flap is perfect. So he's looking at it very carefully. The scope on this laser is uh, just absolutely incredible. A really awesome view for the surgeon. He'll be applying some drops in just a moment. The flap looks, uh, looks like it's in a great position. It's looking really good. So final inspection. Here goes some eye drops in the eye. That little device comes out. That's the procedure itself. Looks good. So we're going to take the patient out. It's looking good. And here comes Dr. Tienen around. Let's go around here. Kevin, congratulations Thank you. on your new vision. It was great. How, how was it? Absolutely perfect. Not, no problems at all. The team were great. Any discomfort? No, nope, not at all. Well, congratulations again. Now, I asked you a few minutes ago if you could see a clock on the wall. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I want to ask you, can you see the clock? On? Yeah, the numbers, the, yeah, everything. Better than you could? Unbelievable. Well, again, Unbelievable. congratulations. You Thank did you great. So Thanks, and Dr. Tienen did a wonderful job. Absolutely. Anyways, been great. you take care. Thank you. All right. Cheers. All right, well, listen, thank you for taking part in this live surgery. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm sure you have questions. We're going to be on Twitter, so visit us if you have any questions at all on hashtag LaserEyeLive. That's hashtag LaserEyeLive. Again, on behalf of the entire team here, thanks for participating in this live surgery.
The laser weapon system, LAWS, temporarily installed aboard the guided missile destroyer USS Dewey, DDG-105, San Diego, California, July 30, 2012. Shown here conducting operational test in San Diego. California is a technology demonstrator built by the Naval Sea Systems Command from commercial fiber solid-state lasers, utilizing combination methods developed at the Naval Research Laboratory. Laws can be directed onto targets from the radar track obtained from a MK-15 Phalanx close-in weapon system, or other targeting source. The Office of Naval Research's Solid State Laser (SSL) portfolio includes laws development and upgrades providing a quick reaction capability for the fleet with an affordable SSL weapon prototype. This capability provides Navy ships a method for sailors to easily defeat small boat threats and aerial targets without using bullets. U.S. Navy video by Office of Naval Research slash released in what could be a scene from Star Wars. The video released by the Navy shows a large mobile laser gun lock target onto an unmanned drone and instantaneously shoot down the object, which explodes and falls to the sea. Dot. Officials said laws may initially be used for encounters with antagonizing small boats and vessels, which Iran has been known to operate, that pose a threat to larger Navy ships. But the high-powered new technology could eventually be used to combat airborne threats, including missiles and drones. The firepower released from laws, in the form of a high-powered infrared laser, can strike down drones in seconds flat, officials demonstrated in a video simulation. Navy officials will install the high-powered laser weapon on the USS Ponce, which is responsible for naval operations in the Persian Gulf area and the Horn of Africa, over the next year, according to NBC News. The laser will become fully operational by summer 2014. Nikola Tesla scientist and electrical engineer invented Tesla coils, alternating current electric generators and was a major early pioneer of radio technology. He also developed what he called a teleforce weapon the press called it a death ray. The year 1918, Tesla apparently had a laser-like apparatus that he shot at the moon. From studying his great 1893 work The Inventions, researches and writings of Nikola Tesla, had all of the components necessary to create a laser beam. This lamp was so constructed so as to place a piece of matter such as carbon, or a diamond or a ruby, in the center, and bombard this button with electrical energy that would bounce off the button onto the inside of the globe and bounce back onto the button. If this were a ruby, and Tesla specifically worked with rubies, then is exactly how a ruby laser is created. Tesla refers in inventions to a pencil-thin line of light that was created with this device. It is my belief that Tesla not only invented the ruby laser in 1893, but he also demonstrated it and published its results. Tesla also created the particle beam Ha Arp Death Ray Earthquake Weapon Scalar Wave Technology Scalar Waves also referred to as Tesla Waves or Longitudinal Waves are capable of penetrating any solid object narration by the reptilian resistance. Lasers are everywhere and are used in a wide variety of applications. They're found in barcode scanners, DVD players, they're used in medicine, they produce dazzling laser light shows, and of course, they're instrumental in micromanufacturing. The acronym LASER, L-A-S-E-R, stands for Light Amplification by Stimulated Emission of Radiation. The term was coined by Gordon Gould when he was a student of Professor Charles Towns at the Columbia University in 1957. Lasers exhibit some unique characteristics. First, they're monochromatic, which is to say that they have a single output wavelength, or a pure color with an extremely narrow line width. Depending on the laser type, 
They can have wavelengths from the ultraviolet through the visible or even in the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Wavelength selection is important depending on the material being laser processed. Uh, as an example, UV lasers are usually best for drilling and cutting plastics. Lasers are also highly directional, where the beam can be as little as one millimeter in diameter and spreads very little over a large distance. In fact, lasers have been bounced off the moon to accurately measure the distance between the moon and the earth. They're also coherent, where all the waves are exactly in phase with one another. The common components of all lasers consist of, first, an active medium, which can be a gas such as in a carbon dioxide laser or a krypton fluoride, for instance, in an excimer laser, which is used to generate high power UV pulses. A solid state laser, on the other hand, has a crystal made of ruby, a neodymium doped yttrium aluminum garlic, or YAG, as we call it, or neodymium doped yttrium lithium fluoride, just to name a few. The gain medium can even be a liquid, although dye lasers are not used in micromanufacturing, and there are several reasons for that. The pumping source or energy input can be electrical, such as an HV discharge in an excimer laser, or it can be optical, using laser diodes to pump, for instance, a YAG or fiber lasers. And lastly, all lasers need an optical feedback, and this consists of a mirror or a high reflector and a partially reflective mirror, and we'll talk much more about that later. Finally, a population inversion is critical sustaining laser operation, where a large number of atoms are in an excited state. Looking at the energy level diagram, an electron is pumped to a highly excited state and transitions to a metastable region. The electron will seek its natural or ground state. However, it must release energy and it does so in the form of a photon. Now, we have a lot of atoms releasing photons in all directions, and this is called spontaneous emission. This is similar to a black light, which is a UV pump source and a fluorescence dye. The dye absorbs the UV wavelength and emits a visible color in all directions. In lasers, stimulated emission is achieved by the optical cavity. Photons bounce back and forth between the mirrors, and as a photon passes an atom in an excited state, it too emits a photon, creating a cascading or a domino effect. The output coupler, being partially reflective, permits the laser beam to exit the cavity. Now, the chart shows the laser types commonly used in manufacturing. Wavelengths can be anywhere from 193 nanometers in the UV to 10.6 microns in the infrared. Average power is typically in the range of a few watts to a few hundred watts. And laser pulse durations can range anywhere from microseconds all the way down to a few femtoseconds. So thank you for viewing and stay tuned for future installments on laser applications and micromanufacturing. If you have any questions or if you want to suggest a future topic on lasers and micromanufacturing, please contact me. Thank you.
What's up guys, how you all doing? Today I'm going to show you a pretty cool experiment with the laser. Let's check this out. First we're gonna put sugar in and let it sit for like 24 hours. So I got a laser over here and if I'm gonna put it to the aquarium water, look, you can see the light is much better. So I put sugar over there, wait, it dissolved and settled down. So all the sugar water is on the bottom. If I'm gonna set the laser all the way down, boom, look at this. The, the laser bends. Why does the light bends with the sugar water on the bottom? Please let me know in comments below how does this work. Pretty awesome, huh? So this water does not have any sugar. And if I'm gonna go up and down, you see light does not bend. So let me know in comments below, what does sugar do? Why does the sugar make the laser, the light, bend? Pretty cool experiment, huh? Warriors with milk, put it in grab a fork and stick it in into the detergent
千卓马。<音>